Okay, good morning everyone and welcome back to Constructive Mathematics. I'm still Patrick Farrell and we are still here to learn about algorithms. So let me uh, set the scene, remind you what we've done so far and put today's lecture in context. So we want to study algorithms from a mathematical perspective. We want to study the questions that we ask about algorithms. And we decided last week that the best way to do that was by means of studying a bunch of examples. So we started off with Euclid's method, which is a, a brilliant example for a few reasons. First of all, it's important. It's still used in your web browser today when you connect to your bank. It's very simple. You can explain it in a few lines. It also has the advantage that somehow it deals with discrete things. It deals with natural numbers, right? So that allows us to focus on certain questions, the kinds of questions that we considered last week about whether the algorithm terminates, whether it always gives us the correct answer, how many operations it takes to do so, while allowing us to neglect other questions that weren't so relevant in that domain, such as if we're constructing a sequence of approximations, how fast does that sequence converge? Because Euclid's method gives us the exact answer in a finite number of iterations. We don't need to worry about sequences of approximations, and we don't need to worry about questions of stability, because there's no sort of sensible notion of perturbing the inputs to Euclid's method. I can't make a small perturbation to two natural numbers and still end up with two natural numbers. So that, that was why it's wise to start with the discrete example, but of course in mathematics not all problems are discrete, many of them are continuous, and so it's time for us to leave this cozy world and you know, go out into the, the harder light of the, you know, the, of the truth, right, in some kind of Lovecraftian sense, and the, the fundamental example of a problem in continuous mathematics is that of root finding, of finding the roots of residuals. Okay, so let me remind you, in the previous lecture, we saw that we could use Euclid's method for a very, very limited sense of root finding. If we had two polynomials and we wanted to find their common roots, then we could calculate their greatest common divisor, and then so long as that was a polynomial of degree four or less, then we could calculate its roots, and so we could find the common roots of both of these. But that, however, is extremely limited, right? You know, real problems, uh, we want to solve you know, equations far beyond finding the, the common roots of two polynomials. Real problems don't come in this format. We want to solve all kinds of equations. We want to solve Navier-Stokes equations to predict how well airplanes fly. We want to solve Einstein field equations to describe how the universe deforms under general relativity. So we're going to study more general problems in these lectures. Okay, so what are we going to do today and beyond? We're going to want to find roots of general, as in not necessarily polynomial, they could be polynomial functions, but not necessarily, of general functions f. And the functions that I want to find roots of, I'll call the residual. Okay, so I want to find the roots of general residuals f. And for this, we turn to root finding algorithms. So we're going to meet a bunch of different algorithms for solving this problem, different root finding algorithms with different approaches. And this should immediately uh, suggest to you that no one of them is going to be perfect, right? So there, you know, there are no sort of working alternatives to Euclid's method because it's perfect. It always gives you the right answer, it always terminates, it always does so in an extremely small number of iterations, but most problems are not like this. Maybe there's, there's not a perfect algorithm, or indeed maybe there is, maybe you will find it. Right? But we will meet a lot of different algorithms with different trade-offs between, for example, guarantees of convergence, how fast it will converge, uh, and, and things like this, and indeed applicability. Okay, so let me formally state the problem that we're looking to solve. So we have a residual f that maps from the reals to the reals, and I want to find an x star, at least one, of course there may be others, and I have a great research interest in finding multiple solutions of roof finding problems, but that's not for first year. So I want to find an x star such that f maps this special input x star to zero. Okay, so I want to find roots of these general functions. And this problem is far broader uh, than it looks at first glance. Right? This encompasses a wide, wide range of problems beyond this that are very important. And maybe make this observation, in mathematics we want to solve equations, right? We've got left-hand sides and right-hand sides, and we want to find inputs so that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. 
Well, how can you do this in general? Well, sort of, remember, we're always trying to canonicalize our problems. One way to canonicalize this problem is to bring the right hand side over to the left hand side, and now you're looking to find roots of the f that's f1 minus f2. So root finding is really just a special case of solving equations where, for convenience, we've gathered all of the terms in the equation to the left-hand side. Okay, so when you think of root finding, really it's much more general than this. It's really solving equations, and equations arise everywhere. Another use, if you want to actually calculate the decimal expansion of a number, Right? Say you want to know the digits of root 2 because, I don't know, I'm always on desert islands. You, you're on a desert island and you want to build a boat and you need to know how long the cross beam should be. Right? Well then if you want to know this to however many digits, then what you would do is you would set up a suitable equation that root 2 is one of the solutions of, like this, and then you would find a root finding algorithm. Right? So for example, this is the way that your calculator calculates square roots. Okay, and so as I said, the algorithms that we will meet from here on in have a somewhat different flavor than Euclid's method. Right? If we think back to a partial list of the questions that we met in lecture zero this time last week, you know, does the algorithm terminate? Does it always give us the right answer? How fast do, does our sequence of approximations converge to the right answer? How many operations does it take to construct those sequences? From this point of view, as I mentioned, Euclid's method is basically perfect, right? It always terminates, it always gives the correct answer. Um, we had no uh, need to worry about sequences of approximations because it always gave us the exact answer in a finite number of operations. And that number of operations, the number of divisions, was logarithmic in the input. So we had very, very few operations to do. Okay, so Euclid's method was perfect. But root finding algorithms, Already we see from this sort of calculating root 2 example, root finding algorithms have this continuous flavor that you'll never compute, or never hope in general, to compute the exact answer in a finite number of operations. Because even if we put together all of the computers that you're sitting in front of in this room, even if you put all the computers together in this building, even if we put all the computers in the world together, we can only represent so many digits of root 2. Right? In a finite universe, we can only store so many digits of root 2. So we'll never get the exact answer. We can only represent some fraction of it. Okay, and indeed because of this fundamental limitation or you know, the, this property that makes the game really interesting, as I said, different algorithms will have different trade-offs for termination, convergence speed, operation count, applicability, and so on. So, let's proceed by example. Let's meet our first root finding algorithm, certainly not the last root finding algorithm that we will see, and certainly not the, the first root finding algorithm invented. In fact, by section, uh, the algorithm that we're about to meet is sort of several millennia newer than, for example, algorithms that were known to the Babylonians and the ancient Greeks. But it has a, a beauty of simplicity that make it, uh, makes it a very nice first root finding algorithm to study. Okay, so let me explain by section, and as usual, our algorithms will be based on theorems, and we will prove theorems about algorithms. Okay, so the first root finding algorithm that we will meet is called bisection, and it's based on a corollary of the intermediate value theorem that you've met in analysis, and it was proven by Bolzano in 1817. Okay, the theorem that we will rely on. So what does the theorem say? So f maps some closed interval a, b to the reals, and now I'm going to have smoothness requirements on my residuals, okay? So for now I'm going to assume that this residual f is continuous, which is a fairly weak assumption, right? I don't need derivatives, I don't need, just, just continuous. Okay, and it has the property that if I evaluate f at a, I evaluate f at b, and I multiply those numbers together, it's less than zero, then there must exist an x star in the open interval a, b, with f of x star is equal to zero. Okay, so that's Bolzano's theorem in 1817. And what is this f of a times f of b less than zero? It's really just a fancy way of saying that if you evaluate f at a and you evaluate f at b, one of them is positive and one of them is negative, and I don't care which way around. It is, right? If both of them were positive, that number would be positive. If both of them were negative, that number would be positive. So you want to have mixed signs in order to satisfy this criterion. And of course, if it's equal to zero, we already have a root. Okay, so this suggests immediately the following algorithm. 
So we evaluate the residual at the midpoint of this interval AB. Okay, so we average A and B, and then we have a trichotomy. We have three possibilities, so let's consider the three possibilities. So the first possibility is that f of c is equal to zero, so we're done. Right, that's great, we found a root. Perfect. The second possibility is that f of c has the same sign as f of a, and that means that by another invocation of Bolzano's theorem, there must exist a root between c and b, right? because the interval cb satisfies the same setup as ab. Or the third possibility is that f of c has the same sign as f of b, so that means that there exists a root between a and c. Okay, so no matter if we evaluate f at the midpoint of our interval, no matter which of the three possibilities occurs, we have gained information, we have, we have learned something. We've either found a root in the first case, or we have shrunk the interval in which we know that a root must exist by a factor of two, right? We've had it. Okay, so let's, let's see this in action. So here's a function, here's a residual. I want to find the special input that maps me to zero, so I want to find this uh, root here. I'm going to start with two pieces of initial data. I need an A naught and a B naught that bracket the root so that one has positive sign, one has negative sign, and then let's proceed with the steps of this algorithm. So we will find the midpoint, of this interval a naught b naught, so that's c naught. Then we evaluate f there, so that's f evaluated at c naught. Okay, so now it's negative, so that means that I can throw away either the a or the b that had the same sign of f, right? So the interval a naught c naught must bracket a root by Bolzano's theorem. So that means that now for the next round of my bisection algorithm, I will call a this A1 and this B1. Right? And then we, we keep going. So we evaluate C1 and as it happens this is very very close to the root but the algorithm doesn't know this, right? doesn't exploit this, it's only looking at the signs. So here the function is negative so we can throw away the B1 so that becomes A2, B2. Then we evaluate at C2, that's now positive so we shrink the interval on that side and so on. Okay, so this is kind of how the algorithm works, um, uh, having the interval at each step. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and state this as an algorithm. So what are the inputs to my process? I have a residual that maps from A to B, uh, AB to the reals. I want that to be a continuous function. I need two inputs that bracket the root, and I'm going to give myself a tolerance greater than zero to decide when to terminate. When am I close enough to uh, a root? Okay, and so bisect takes in this data, f, a, b, and the tolerance, and then so I'm going to keep looping while the length of the interval between b minus a and divide that by two is greater than the tolerance, right? Because I know that my root is somewhere between a and b, so the, the most that it could be is, uh, is uh, the, the biggest error that I could make in my approximation of the root is this quantity here, so I'll keep looping until that is bigger than my tolerance. And then inside the loop, I evaluate the midpoint of A and B, I check my trichotomy if f of c is equal to zero, then return the midpoint. Otherwise, if this holds, then I set update A to be c. Otherwise, if this holds, I update B to be c, and then I keep looping until this holds. Okay, and so you know it's always good when you meet an algorithm to, t to think about uh, when is this applicable? What information am I actually exploiting about the problem? Because you know almost always, if you exploit more information, if you exploit more structure of the problem, you hope to do better. And this algorithm actually exploits very very little structure of the problem. Right, we're not even using the value of f, which is kind of a crazy thing when you think about it, right? It's sort of strange to reflect upon because we're looking for special inputs that have a special value, f. We only want to know the sign. And this could be a good thing in that, you know, maybe, for example, you know, the f might be very quick and easy to evaluate, or it could be the case that in order to evaluate f, it requires three weeks on a supercomputer, right? And it may be 
the case, this does arise sometimes, that it's possible to certify what sign your f might have without actually calculating the f. Right? So you don't actually need to know what the value of the residual is. Maybe you just need to have some sort of computational proof that the value of f is going to be positive or negative, and that can be much, much faster than evaluating the residual. So this can be convenient. But it can also be a bad thing because you're not exploiting information about the problem. You're leaving information on the table. So of course, this won't be the algorithm that will be most used in practice. OK, and so uh, if you haven't figured out by now, I really love history and the history of maths. Um, so I spent a few hours uh, trying to find out the history of bisection. And it's really frustrating. There's, there's very, very little written um, in the mathematical history literature. So I asked. Um, one of the mathematical historians here in the department, Christopher Hollings, uh, to see what he could come up with. And the first uh, reference that he could find uh, was in Cauchy's famous textbook of analysis, his Cours d'Analyse, published in 1821. Right? So when you think that you know, this idea is, is so simple that you could totally, if you were sent back in time, you, know, you could totally have explained this to a, you know, a Babylonian mathematician. And indeed, you know, think about this as your meal ticket, that if you ever do get sent back in time and you don't want to be you know, some sort of farming peasant or serf or whatever, you want to be the court mathematician to the Babylonian emperor, then bisection is your meal ticket, right? Because you, you know, you'll have discovered this two millennia before Koshi and you'll become rich and famous. Right? So that's the, that's the plan. OK, and so let's see. Let's now start asking the questions that we ask of algorithms. Does this algorithm terminate? And the answer is yes, the algorithm always terminates. And here is the argument. So in the kth iteration of that while loop, either the function returns, in which case it terminates, or it shrinks the absolute value between b and a by a factor of 2. And then for any given tolerance by sort of the elementary properties of the real numbers, there exists some natural number such that if you divide b minus a, sort of the initial b and a, by 2 to the k minus 1, if you make k big enough, you can find a k so that this inequality is satisfied. And so the algorithm has to terminate, right? Because we're shrinking the interval by 2. And so if you shrink the interval by 2 enough times, you'll always meet whatever tolerance you will set, so long as that tolerance is greater than 0. OK, so that's great that bisection always terminates, at least if you have the setup to apply it. OK, and so let's go ahead and, and use this. Uh, let's try to solve uh, for x equals cos x. So I want to find the input x so that x equals cos x. So I've got an equation to solve. So I take the right-hand side over to the left-hand side, or the other way around. It doesn't matter. Um, so I've got f of x equals x minus cos x. And I want to find the roots of that. Now, usually the hard part in bisection is trying to get the initial data that's required to apply the algorithm in the first place. It, it may not be easy to find two inputs that bracket the root with sort of different signs. Right? But here it's kind of intuitive because you know, the absolute value of cos x, well, cos x is going to be between minus 1 and 1. So you just think that if I make x big enough positively, then the residual will be positive. And if I make x negative enough, then uh, the residual will be negative. And indeed, that's the case. So if I evaluate f at minus 10, I get a number that's about minus 10, so that's negative. If I evaluate f at 10, I get something that's about 10, so that's positive. And so we're good to go. Right? So in this case, it's fairly easy to sort of intuitively identify two inputs uh, that bracket the root. And then now we proceed as, as the algorithm outlines. So the average of minus 10 and 10 is 0. We evaluate f at 0. We get minus 1. So the updated interval is 0, 10. Then we compute the average of that. We get 5. We evaluate f there. So then we decide which side to shrink, and so on. Right? So we proceed through all the steps of the algorithm. OK, and so the true solution is approximately something like 0.739085. So we are getting there, but slowly. You know, if, if you're the court mathematician to the Babylonian emperor, you probably have workers to do your calculations for you. And you know, even if you have to do it yourself, this is kind of enough calculations to keep you busy you know, between coffee and lunch or something, right? It's not, not fatal. But it's not, it's not super fast either. So we'll, we're going to meet other algorithms that are going to construct sequences of approximations that are much, much, much faster than this, but with weaker guarantees of termination. OK, so let's 
uh, discuss some of its properties from the point of view of the questions that we ask about algorithms. So when it applies, it is guaranteed to converge, which of course is a really useful property to have, right? There's having a theorem that says you're going to get the right answer is, is very useful. The method is very simple. It's very robust. You could explain it to a Babylonian mathematician and he would totally understand you. In fact, they may well have discovered it in just the clay tablets or whatever that they wrote it down on were lost through the ages of time, right? It's entirely possible that this was known already. Its smoothness requirements are very low. So the only thing we asked about the residual F was continuity, right? So this again sort of comes back to the point of how much structure of the problem are you exploiting? If I have a function that's only continuous but not differentiable, then I'm probably going to use different algorithms to find its roots than a function that's C infinity or analytic or polynomial or some more specialized class, right? So because its smoothness requirements are very low, that you only require continuity, this means that you can apply it to a, a great many problems that you can't apply other root finding algorithms that will study that require derivatives that use calculus. However, of course, there are some downsides also. So the first downside that you might remark upon is that the interval of interest only shrinks by a factor of two each time. So we're having sort of the, the interval in which we know that a root must exist. And you know, this is this is okay, but it's it's not blazing fast, right? You're not going to impress people by how quickly your sequence is converging if your error is decaying by a factor of two each time. We want to devise algorithms that converge at lightning speed. And this is, this is where we will go in future lectures. It can be very hard to set up. It can be very hard to find the two points A and B that bracket the roots, right? This is, this is, maybe it's easy or maybe it's difficult, but it certainly hinders its general applicability. It is hard, not impossible, but maybe almost impossible to generalize the ideas of bisection to higher dimensions. Because, you know, here in first year, we're always thinking of things in one dimension, right? But in real life, the problems that we are looking at are not posed from the reals to the reals. They're posed from R a million to R a million, or they're posed on infinite dimensional spaces when we're looking to solve for functions, you know, the, the velocity and pressure around an aircraft or the, the metric that the Einstein field equations in general relativity describe. And so while we are studying algorithms in this one dimensional context, it's really good to keep it in mind that, you know, is what we're going to, what we're studying, is it able to extend beyond this context? And with bisection, the answer is basically no. There are some hardy souls that tried it. If you Google bisection in higher dimensions, you can find some papers uh, about it, but these algorithms don't appear to be very effective. This idea of bracketing the roots by looking at sign information is really a one dimensional idea and it doesn't extend to two dimensions, never mind to a million dimensions or infinite dimensions. So whereas you know, these disadvantages, linear you know, the, the factor of two convergence or the difficulty of setting it up, they're inconvenient but maybe not fatal, this is the one that's really fatal to bisection's ambitions to be the algorithm for root finding and so this is what motivates us to look at other algorithms. Another small comment is that it can never find roots of even multiplicity. So what do I mean by that? Just the same as the multiplicity of a root of a polynomial. So if I have a root x star of a residual f, so it has multiplicity k if all the derivatives up to k are zero. Okay, so if you have a polynomial and you know two is a root twice over, the polynomial is zero at that root and its derivative is zero at that root. Right? And the exact same thing uh, carries over to more general residuals. And so if you have a root of even multiplicity, what it means is that sort of, you know, it comes down and it touches the axis, but then it goes back the same side, either positive or negative. And so you don't have two inputs bracketing it that are of opposite signs. So you cannot apply bisection. Just think about applying bisection, for example, to find the roots of f of x equals x squared. It, you can never make it work. Okay, and so as I say, later we will study other methods with different sets of advantages and disadvantages. 
Before uh, we move on, sort of a palate cleanser, um, I want to shift gears a little to talk about a, a different topic, which is the rate of convergence of a sequence, because this is one of the ways that we are going to characterize whether we like algorithms, whether they converge quickly or whether they converge slowly. So we need to be able to discuss this in mathematical terms. And so you are now in your third term of studies in maths at Oxford, and you've had your head stuffed full of information about when a sequence converges and what it means for a sequence to converge and all of the different tests that you might execute to determine and prove whether a sequence is converging or not. But you haven't seen much about how fast a sequence is converging once you do have a converging sequence. So let's talk about that. Okay, so you've studied a great deal about whether sequences converge. Now let's consider how fast do they converge. So the first kind of convergence that I'd like to introduce to you is this notion of linear convergence. Okay, so suppose we have a sequence of approximations. So these, for example, might be the midpoints of this interval AB that bisection is producing. Okay, and we say that the sequence converges linearly if there exists some number between 0 and 1 such that the following holds. So the limit as i goes to infinity, so you know, once you execute enough iterations of your algorithm, so let's just ignore the limit for now, it's not, not so important. On the top of this fraction, we've got the error at iteration i plus 1. Right? This is the distance between the true solution that I want to know and the, error, uh, the approximation produced by my algorithm at, at iteration i plus 1. On the bottom, I've got the error of the approximation that my algorithm has produced at iteration i. Okay? And so what this is saying is that if you take the ratio of the error after one, st after one more step to the error beforehand, it should be this fixed fraction mu, which is called the rate of convergence. Okay, so imagine, for example, that mu was a half. What this is saying is that eventually, once you go out enough terms in the sequence, you are going to have the error at every step of your algorithm. Okay, so in other words, asymptotically, once you've done enough work, maybe there's you know, a fixed number of iterations at the start where this isn't true, but eventually, moving one step along the sequence, so doing one more round of the algorithm, doing one more set of operations, it multiplies the error by a fixed ratio mu less than 1. And so this mu is the rate of convergence. Okay. And of course, the, you, know, the, you can construct pathological examples where you know, you're going to converge linearly but only after a billion terms and that's maybe not so practical. So we also, this is com somehow uh, ignoring the pre-asymptotic behavior. This is only considering what happens at the tails of the sequence. But that's okay. That's often what happens when we study sequences. Okay, and so it won't surprise you to learn that for bisection, the sequence of midpoints of these intervals that we are constructing is converging linearly with mu uh, half, or at least sort of this error is bounded by something that is converging with mu equals a half. You might have done better, but you know that, that the bound is converging with mu a half. Okay, so that's linear convergence. Can we do better? And the answer is yes. Okay, so then if you're doing better than that, we're going to call that superlinear convergence. So we have a sequence xi that's converging to a root x star. And we say that the sequence converges superlinearly if in the limit that ratio is now equal to 0. OK, so what does that mean? What it means that if you go far enough along the sequence, you are doing better than any fixed linear rate of convergence. Right? So, you know, you could take mu to be, you know, 1 over a million and eventually your error is going to do better than 1 over a million uh, times the error at the previous step. Okay, so if you go far enough out along the sequence, you're doing better than any linear rate of convergence. Okay, and so, for example, here's a sequence, so 1 over 2 to the 2 to the n. So that looks like 1 over 2, 1 over 4, 1 over 16, 1 over 2, 5, 6, and so on. So this is converging to 0. So we know what the error is. The error of my approximation is just the value itself. And if you calculate the ratio, if you compare 4 to 2, that's a factor of 2. If you compare 16 to 4, that's a factor of 4. If you compare 2, 5, 6 to 16, it's always getting better than any fixed linear rate of convergence that you might specify. Okay? So this is a sequence that's converging to 0 superlinearly. Okay? And once we have superlinear convergence, that's really the the regime we want to be in, that's the game we want to play, then we can further 
classify what's going on, uh, you know, uh, ref more refined classification. Okay, so suppose that we have a sequence xi converging to x star and it's going super linearly. Okay, and then we say that the sequence converges with order q if now, if in this limit, I put a q here on the denominator and I have this limit exists, this limit equals some m greater than zero, which and now it doesn't, it no longer needs to satisfy that m is less than one. Okay, and so let's, let's just think through what that means. Uh, let's imagine that q equals two. What it means is that asymptotically, the error at iteration i plus one looks like some constant times the square of the error at iteration i. And since we're thinking of our errors as hopefully getting small, if you take something small and you square it, then that's going to be much, much smaller, and that would have order of convergence two, that would be quadratic convergence. If q were three, then you would be cubing the error up to a constant at every iteration. So we would call that cubic convergence and so on. And we will meet algorithms next week with quadratic convergence with cubic convergence. Uh, one other uh, thing to say uh, before we move on though is that this order of convergence q doesn't necessarily have to be a natural number. So on the problem sheet there's a nice uh, optional question that sort of it works you through the proof to show that a certain algorithm that's described on the problem sheet has order of convergence the golden ratio 1.61828 right so the order of convergence doesn't necessarily have to be have to be a natural number okay but before we meet these so the sort of before we go to this promised land of algorithms that converge much more quickly we need to take another uh, digression to study what are called fixed point iterations, okay? because the algorithms that we meet that will have better convergence will be of this class of fixed point iterations, so we should understand something of fixed point iterations first. Okay? So this is now our next section on fixed point iterations. Okay, so we have uh, so far in this lecture been considering root finding, finding special inputs to a function f so that f of x star is equal to zero. This is a very broad and important class of problems. And this class of problems has a brother, or maybe a cousin, I don't know how close, close you are to your brothers or cousins, which is the task of finding fixed points. Okay, so here's the sort of the related problem that's related to this root finding one. So given a function g, so I'll always use f for the functions I want to find roots of, I'll always use g for the functions I want to find fixed points of. So given a g that maps some interval to the reals, I want to find an x star in AB such that g of x star is equal to x star. So I want to find a special input, not that maps to zero, but rather that maps back to itself. That on this special input, the function g is an identity that x star is a, is a fixed point of this map g. Okay, and so root finding algorithms and fixed point problems, or root finding problems and fixed point problems, are very, very closely related, but it's not a one to one sort of duality between them. But we can cash in a root finding problem for a fixed point problem, and vice versa, we can cash in a fixed point problem for a root finding problem. And there's different ways of going back, back and forth between this, these two classes of problems. And those different ways of going back and forth between these two classes of problems will give us different algorithms. So, for example, let's suppose that you start off with a fixed point problem, find x star so that g of x star is equal to x star. Then you could cash that in for a root finding problem by just looking to solve this equation. So you take the right hand side over to the left hand side and find the roots of g of x minus x. Okay? And indeed we did that when we were looking for fixed points of costs earlier. Okay, so that's one way of going from a fixed point problem to a root finding problem. Of course there are other ways. And vice versa, if you have a root finding problem, f of x is equal to zero, you could, if you wanted to, it wouldn't be a good way to go about it, but you could, if you wanted to, search for fixed points of the function g of x is f of x plus x. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of the first, most obvious way of transforming from a root finding problem to a fixed point problem, but there will be other ways of doing this with other properties that will induce better algorithms. Okay, and transforming uh, between these two classes of problems, why do we want to do this at all? The answer really is that there are very, very powerful theorems that we can invoke about finding fixed points of functions. Okay, so we will meet 
some of these theorems today. We will meet, uh, you will meet more of these theorems next year in part A and second year. And in fact, if you continue your studies to fourth year to part C, there's an entire part C course C4.6 fixed point methods for nonlinear PDEs. And so the study of fixed points, you can take a very, very, very long way. Right? So we will, we will only dip our toes in the water here. But th this is really why uh, cashing in a root funding problem for a fixed point problem is very useful, because there are lots and lots of theorems that we can invoke um, about fixed point problems. OK, so when can we show, first of all, that fixed points exist? Under what conditions might we guarantee that fixed points exist. So let's first, uh, let's meet our first of many fixed point theorems that you will meet in your mathematical career. And this one is at least the sort of the baby version, the little brother posed in one dimension of a beautiful and fundamental theorem called Brouwer's fixed point theorem. And so here's what Brouwer had to say. Uh, if G maps a closed interval AB back to itself, so it maps AB to AB, and that function g is continuous, then it has a fixed point. Okay? So these are quite weak conditions. These are quite general. Okay? We just need that g maps itself to itself and that g is continuous, then we automatically know that it has a fixed point. This is very, very powerful. Now, just a word of warning, usually when you're setting up these problems, as you will find out probably to your cost, in second year when you have to do lots of fixed point problems. Um, the hard part of setting up this theorem is that G maps some interval back to itself. Okay? And because it's hard to think about things if you don't have a word for them, I'll tell you what the word, the word that we'll use for such a function is an endomorphism. Okay? So I want G to be an endomorphism. That's a $2 word, but really it just says that it's mapping some set back to itself. Okay? And so we need G to be an endomorphism in order to apply Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So this result doesn't hold for general continuous G. So I can give you a continuous G that doesn't have any fixed points such that you know, G of X maps X to X plus 1. Clearly this has no fixed points. So we need G to be an endomorphism. OK, so let's uh, see the proof of sort of the little baby uh, brother version of Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So, OK, if I, if I take an x and evaluate g on it, it must be between a and b. So that means that g of x must lie between a and b with sort of greater than or equal to signs for all potential inputs in a, b. OK, and so let's cash in our fixed point problem for a root finding problem. So if I associate the residual g of x minus x, this must have f of a greater than or equal to 0 by this inequality, and it must have f of b less than or equal to 0 by this inequality. OK, so we're almost there to apply Bolzano's theorem. If either inequality is, in fact, an equality, so f, or f of a or f of b are equal to 0, then we have a fixed point, right? So a or b in those cases will be fixed points. So now without loss of generality, we can assume that in fact f of a is greater than 0 and f of b is less than 0. And so then we can invoke Bolzano's theorem because now we have a root funding problem and we have bracketed the root. So that means that there must exist a root x star of f of x in the open interval a, b. Okay? And so if you're a root of f, you're a fixed point of g, so g of x star must equal x star. Okay, so that's, that's very nice. Of course, this theorem, you know, Bolzano's theorem is sort of a very one-dimensional thing, and our proof of Brouwer's fixed point theorem relied very heavily on Bolzano's, but actually Brouwer's fixed point theorem is much, much more general. So if you study, for example, algebraic topology, or you carry on uh, with your studies in this direction, you, you will see a, a more general proof of Brouwer's fixed point theorem. Okay, so we have existence of a fixed point, but that's not all. <laughs> If you give me very slightly stronger conditions, then we can prove uniqueness of the fixed point. OK, so here are some stronger conditions that will guarantee us uniqueness of our fixed point. So now I want g to be differentiable. Before, I only wanted it to be continuous. So a g is an endomorphism that's differentiable. And moreover, I have a bound on the value, the absolute value of the derivative of g for every x in the open interval a, b. Okay? 
So what does that what does that mean? What it means is that if I have a function g Okay, so I've got some function g at any point I can put a cone with slopes plus or minus 1 and the tangent to that curve must lie within that cone. Okay, that's what that requirement is saying. So imagine sort of translating this cone along the function and the tangent to the curve must always lie within that cone. Okay, so in this case then g has a unique fixed point in the open interval at AB. All right, so let's go ahead and see the proof of that. And the proof of this result will rely on the mean value theorem, which you've already met in analysis. But let me remind you. So the mean value theorem was proved by Cauchy in 1823. What does it say? If g maps an interval AB to the reals is differentiable, then there must exist some c in the open interval AB so that the slope of the function at c matches the secant line joining sort of the start point and the end point of the curve. Okay, so this is the slope of the secant line joining the start and end point of the curve, and there has to exist some point in between, at least one, maybe more than one, so that the slope at that point matches the secant. Okay, Cauchy proved that theorem in 1823, and as we saw already in this lecture, he wrote his famous textbook on analysis in 1821. So imagine how he must have been kicking himself, right? That like, ah, oh, he'd already written this book and then he discovers something that totally should have been in there. There's, you know, he, he must have been really annoyed, right? To, th this should have been two years before, not two years after. Okay, so let's use the mean value theorem to prove this result about the uniqueness of our fixed points. Okay, so we know already that G is differentiable, so that means it must be continuous. So that means that by the the previous Brouwer's fixed point theorem, we know that there must exist at least one fixed point of G. Okay, and now let's suppose that there are in fact two fixed points of G in the open interval AB. So in other words, we have G of P is equal to P and G of Q is equal to Q. Okay, so we've got two distinct fixed points and without loss of generality, we'll assume that P is the lesser of them, so P is less than Q. Okay, and then we'll apply Cauchy's mean value theorem uh, in the interval PQ. So we find that there must exist an R in the open interval PQ such that G dash of R, so the slope at this point R, is equal to the slope joining the secant line of this closed interval. So that's G of Q minus G of P divided by Q minus P. But now we use the fact that by assumption P and Q are fixed points of G. So g of q is equal to q, g of p is equal to p, and now on the top and the bottom we have the same quantity so that the slope must in fact equal 1. But we have assumed that that can't be the case, that the slope is always strictly less than 1, and so uh, this is a contradiction. Okay, so we have a result on when fixed points exist. We have, if you give me some stronger conditions, we can assert that fixed points are unique. That's really useful. How do we turn this into an algorithm, right? How do we actually solve algorithmically a fixed point problem? It's an extremely simple idea. You take an x naught in your interval a and b, between a and b, and then you just evaluate g on it, and you set that to be xi plus 1. And if that's not good enough, you apply g again. And if that's not good enough, you apply g again. And if that's not good enough, you apply g again. Okay, and we'll just keep evaluating g, 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 and then we hope that this will converge to a fixed point. Okay, so let's, let's just go ahead and, and state that as an algorithm. So we've got an endomorphism g, we've got an initial guess within this input interval. So here's our function, function fixed point. It takes in g, the initial guess, and a tolerance. Okay, so we set x to be the initial guess x0. We evaluate g of x minus x. We see how far away from being a fixed point we are. If that is greater than the tolerance, then we still have work to do, so we'll keep looping. So we just update x to be g of x. And then uh, if this has terminated, then you've already evaluated g of x. So uh, once it terminates, you've already evaluated g of x, so you may as well return g of x, because you've already done the work. Does this 
terminate? Well, not always, right? It's going to be uh, somehow more subtle to prove that this, that this while loop eventually ends, that we actually do meet this condition. Okay, and so our goal is to investigate uh, when this converges. So now, so remember, we've seen existence of fixed points, uniqueness of fixed points under stronger conditions, and then we're going to have stronger conditions again that guarantee the convergence of this algorithm. But before we do so, let's just sort of make this visual. Let's try to draw a picture. Um, and I want to thank the lecturer who taught this course uh, beforehand for having made this nice picture that sort of describes it. OK, so we've got our function y is equal to g of x. So this is the function that we want to find the fixed points of. And then we have the line y equals x. So we want to find the intersection of these two curves. That's what it means to find a fixed point. OK, and so we start off. So this is what we want to find. We want to find this intersection of these two curves. That's our fixed point. OK, so we start off with some x0. And so then we evaluate g on it. And that sort of takes us onto the curve. right? So we have the point x0, g of x0. And then I want to set x1 to be g of x0. So that's somehow you can think of as projecting horizontally onto the line y equals x. OK, so I overwrite. Uh, the first coordinate with the second coordinate. So that's projecting horizontally onto the line y equals x. And now I go around again. So I evaluate g at x1, and that takes me onto the curve y equals g of x. I then project horizontally onto the line. That takes me here. I then evaluate g to get me back onto the, the line y equals g of x. I project horizontally and so on. And so what you see actually is that sort of there's this beautiful visual interpretation that we're kind of spiraling in to the fixed point. At least in this case, the algorithm appears to be converging with this nice spiraling behavior that's very pretty. OK, so when will this fixed point algorithm converge? The answer is given by one of the great theorems of mathematics, one of the greatest theorems, I would say, of mathematics. Banach's contraction mapping theorem. And it's my privilege today to introduce you at least to its version in, in one dimension. You will meet more general versions of Banach's contraction mapping theorem next year. So the way that you will prove the existence of solutions to ordinary differential equation initial value problems is by setting up an algorithm and proving that it's a contraction invoking Banach's contraction mapping theorem. And so it, it, it's a great privilege to get to talk about this. OK, so let's recall the settings. So we've got an endomorphism g. We know that it's, we're going to assume that its derivative is strictly less than 1 in absolute value for every x in the open interval. And we want to find uh, the fixed points. OK, and we know that this g has a unique fixed point by the argument previously. And then we proposed the iteration scheme. You start with any initial guess, and you keep evaluating g until convergence. OK, and so in other words, we're checking the sequence x0, g of x0, g of g of x0 to find the hopefully, well, to find the unique fixed point. OK, and so this algorithm uh, doesn't require derivatives, right? I'm just evaluating g, so I don't need to evaluate any derivatives of g. And can we devise conditions for convergence that don't require any derivatives? And we'll see this next. This is the contraction mapping theorem. OK, and the key. A criterion that will guarantee us convergence is that G is a so-called contraction. So let me tell you what that means. OK, so we have G, an endomorphism. It maps an interval back to itself. And I'm going to say that this G is a contraction if there exists some constant gamma, which might be 0, but that's kind of a boring case. But this gamma is strictly less than 1 so that this inequality holds. So the distance between g of x and g of y is strictly is less than or equal to gamma times the distance between x and y. So let's, let's sort of uh, imagine what's, what's going on here. You give me two inputs to the function. They have some distance between them. I map both of these inputs under the function. And now the distance between their images must be less than or equal to gamma times the first distance. And because this gamma is less than 1, 
I, I've shrunk the distance, right? That's why it's a contraction. It shrinks the distance between pairs of input points. It's contracting this distance. If I apply g to both of these points again, I shrink the distance some more by a factor gamma. I apply g again, I shrink the distance some more by a factor gamma, and so on. And this gamma must be strictly less than 1. OK, and so let's put that in the previous context. If you are differentiable, this doesn't require that g is differentiable, but if you are differentiable, if you have an absolute value, your derivative bounded by some gamma which is strictly less than 1, then you are a contraction. Okay, So this is very slightly stronger than the conditions we had for uniqueness, because the uniqueness requirement was that the absolute value of g dash of x was just uh, strictly less than 1. Whereas this sort of is asserting the existence of some gap, right? Your, deriv your derivative could get arbitrarily close to 1. It, it, it's always strictly less than 1, but it could get arbitrarily close. Whereas here, there's some gap between gamma and 1 that you're not allowed to intrude upon. You're always uh, bounded by this gap, this gamma, uh, away from 1. OK, so this condition is very, very slightly stronger, subtly so, than the condition that guaranteed uniqueness of the fixed point. And if you satisfy this condition, then you are indeed a contraction. Okay, And you can show that by the mean value theorem. So if you take an x and y in the interval a, b, by the mean value theorem, there exists some c in the open interval between, so that g of x minus g of y, the distance between them, is equal to g dash of c into x minus y. And then because you can bound this derivative in absolute value by gamma, you have strictly less than or equal to, or sorry, not strictly, less than or equal to gamma times the distance between x minus y. Okay, so we had continuity to show existence of fixed points. We had derivative strictly less than 1 in absolute value to show uniqueness. And now we want some small gap between 1 and the derivative in order to show that you're a contraction. Okay, and so this is indeed more general than being differentiable. So not all contractions are differentiable. So for example, if I take g of x to be the absolute value of x divided by 2, this is a contraction with gamma is a half because we're dividing by 2 here. But it's not differentiable because the absolute value function isn't differentiable. OK, and so now that we know what a contraction is, it shrinks the distance between pairs of input points by some fixed fraction, gamma bounded away from 1. Now we're in a position to state one of the great theorems of 20th century mathematics. You know, I would say that this is one of humanity's finest cultural outputs on a par with the Mona Lisa and the Hagia Sophia and you know, Beethoven symphonies. Right? This, is, this, is, this is really as good as it gets. OK, so it's pr it was proven by Stefan Banach just over 100 years ago in 1922. And here's what it says. So if g is an endomorphism, so it maps an interval onto itself. Of course, Banach proved it in a more general context, but we'll state it in one dimension. If g is a contraction, then it has a unique fixed point x star. And moreover, the iteration scheme that I proposed, xi plus 1 equals g of xi, converges to the fixed point, to the unique fixed point. And moreover, that convergence is at least linear. OK, so not only do we have uniqueness of our fixed points, we also have an algorithm that converges. And we have guarantees on how fast that algorithm converges. OK, so this is, this is a bombshell because it's proving existence of a solution. So for example, this is how you will prove existence of solutions to differential equations by setting up contractions and invoking the contraction mapping theorem. So this gives you existence of solutions. It doesn't assume existence of a solution. It gives you existence. Uh, but moreover, it's constructive. It gives you an algorithm that actually gets you there, which is fantastic. Okay, so as I said, this is sort of the, the little brother of Banach's contraction mapping theorem. Banach proved his theorem more general complete metric spaces, which you will meet next year in the very imaginatively titled metric spaces and complex analysis, of course. And I won't prove this theorem. We'll prove it next time. But I just wanted to mention uh, this uh, has a very interesting history and, and sort of a, a sad history, actually. So, so Banach, you know, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, an extremely famous uh, person, he spent his whole academic career in Lvov, which is now Lviv in Western Ukraine. 
And he was, he was a Pole. Um, and being a Pole in Lviv over the years 1892 to 1945 was pretty eventful, as you can imagine. So, you know, when he was born, he was a citizen of Austria-Hungary. Then he became a citizen of an independent Poland. Then in 1939, the Soviets invaded when Germany invaded Poland from one side and the Soviets from another. And the Soviets weren't big fans of Polish intellectuals, as you probably have heard. And then in 1941, the Nazis invaded Ukraine. And they also weren't big fans of Polish intellectuals, many Polish intellectuals died in concentration camps. And in fact, Balak uh, survived the war. He, he died just after it finished. He, survived, he was fired from his position as professor at this university in, in Lvov. And he survived the war by the following mechanism. He became a feeder of lice. So uh, you might have heard of the disease typhus that's spread by lice. Typhus was a big problem for the militaries, including the German military, because you know, many millions of soldiers in the 20th century died of typhus. And it turns out that one of the leading places in the world for the study of typhus was an institute in Lvov. And they were making vaccines for typhus that the German army wanted to distribute to its soldiers. And the way that this works is that they would have lice and they would infect them with typhus and the lice needed to eat and lice eat human blood. So Banach and his son went from being, well, Banach went from being a professor at this university, this world famous academic, uh, to a feeder of lice. They would strap lice uh, to his thighs so that they could eat his blood. Um, and, but in this way, he survived the war. He wasn't deported uh, to a death camp because he, he was useful for the German military. And so quite a sad um, and poignant story and sort of, you know, definitely not the end that one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century uh, deserved. Anyway, we'll leave it there and we'll study the proof of the contraction mapping theorem next time. Thanks very much.